uh, we have been doing a, um, a research uh, as curators, um, that is Sheldon Brown and uh, Jordan Crandall and myself. We imagine that it might be possible to do an entire year of, of research within the gallery uh, in order to establish mm, uh, a deeper analysis uh, than one can do with just a single uh, gesture, a single exhibition. And so uh, the phase one uh, was bringing to the foreground uh, drone art projects that had already um, been produced. Among those who first presented uh, and that I first thought about was Alex Rivera and uh, Angel Navares, who created the Low Drone in 2005, which I think was probably uh, among the first, if not the first, drone art project. And uh, so it was an exhibit that allowed us to, to look at aesthetic practices around uh, the question of what I might call dronology, right? And what are the uh, constituent factors? Uh, 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 Jordan was interested in affective uh, tendencies around dronology. Uh, um, uh, Sheldon is very interested in the way engineering and research is being choreographed around uh, the drone. And at least for me, one of the things that uh, um, out of the performative matrix of dronology that I was interested in was the way artists had uh, developed um, um, tactics uh, uh, that intervened into the question of dronology. Uh, not just the affects, but uh, the effects that are at play. And so during the second uh, phase, uh, we had a series of panels by uh, scholars, um, engineers, um, uh, a wide area discussion uh, around uh, this issue of dronology and drones. And um, both in terms of films such as uh, Sleep Dealer that Alex Rivera created. Uh, we saw sections of Omar uh, Fess's uh, 5,000 Feet is Best, uh, and also looked at, at certain histories of uh, drone culture, uh, which um, in a recent anthology called Game of Drones, uh, um, there was uh, a nice uh, uh, takeoff of uh, Architus in uh, 350 BC, who developed the first unmanned steam-powered pigeon, right? Uh, it completed 200-meter flight, self-propelled. Uh, it's channeling the ingenuity of a technology uh, which was disregarded by Plato and Aristotle, who happened to be there, right? Uh, and his proposition was that steam power would allow us to uh, shift the condition of slave labor, uh, all these sort of things. But of course, uh, um, Plato grumbled that only the transcendent was the true geometer uh, of this. So uh, drone and dronologies are ancient, right? And they often create circuits uh, with whatever are the engines of powers uh, that are either uh, two in the forefront, such as in 350 uh, BC, steam power was not uh, seen as useful. So in this particular game of drones tonight, uh, it's to um, take this uh, phase three and look at the uh, trajectories of um, artistic work that has been developed as the outcome of, of, the, of the gestures. So we had uh, Jordan Crandall who produced a play, a performance, Unmanned. And tonight, uh, in terms of uh, looking at the work of unmanned interventions, uh, is to watch the process of developing uh, prototypes, uh, gestures that might uh, indicate ways in which we can intervene uh, aesthetically in this space of dronology. So um, what we're going to do is have the artist speak for about 10 minutes and, and then have a, a, a conversation uh, that you can um, uh, share with them. Uh, first will be Trish Stone, uh, an artist who uh, has work uh, 
uh, out here that you can drift into the hallway. And the great thing about uh, uh, Trish Stone is not only that uh, she is uh, an artist that has been developing an intense relationship with uh, what I would call intimate surveillance, uh, developing ways in which one can, uh, in a no-fi way, uh, counteract surveillance, has taken on the issue of uh, an intimate uh, dronology. That is, uh, how does one participate in the language of the predator, of the Gorgon drone, in another way than in, in developing uh, uh, you know, something that is several thousand dollars, hundreds of thousand dollars, so on, right? Can you do it simply? Uh, can you reach the sort of uh, aesthetics of what a drone surveillance could be? And I, I think she uh, does that uh, in a unique and, and powerful way. Uh, next, Sean Estelle, who is a young artist here, uh, an undergraduate. I think he's in the honors cast, a class uh, this year. Uh, he got a research grant for the, uh, at Cal IT2 during the summer. And uh, he began to look at the protocols of what I would call uh, the uh, drone divide. That is, uh, how do we access information about drones? Who has access to drones? Uh, and what sort of technologies are necessary to access that? And then finally, Alex Rivera, uh, 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 pushing forth on this uh, kind of direct uh, manipulation of, of drones uh, and the uh, hex that he's been building here uh, right in front of you. Uh, kind of Dia de los Muertos uh, uh, drone. So uh, without further ado, I, uh, oh, oh, one thing, sorry, to intervene on my own drones. On uh, November 1st, we will have uh, two other artists who are presenting here, Gregory Cholet, iDrone, uh, right behind us, who is a graduate from, in uh, MFA from 1990, I believe and is now considered uh, one of the uh, core scholars around tactical media, uh, activist work, and uh, he created the iDrone as kind of an archive to knowledge that uh, we don't often access uh, through drone culture. And then Ian Allen Paul, who is a researcher here this quarter at Bang Lab, uh, who is also working uh, on series of drones and uh, has developed a, a, an open drone database where uh, individuals can begin to upload uh, images, text on these particular <laughs> issues. Um, so uh, if you'll come down here uh, and I'll transfer the, uh, the space. So, hi everyone. Uh, let's just go down to the video so you can see them and I'll talk about them down there. So this is a really interesting spot in the building. Uh, we are right across from our server room, which is, houses all the data and networking for the projects here. And along this wall, we put up these four videos. And uh, each of these videos, uh, just to give you an idea of what you're looking at, was taken from a little tiny flip camera that I attached to a balloon that was filled with helium. And then I could send it up and get aerial surveillance recordings from it. So the, the best one to really get an idea of what the balloon looked like is this one, because you can see it's a big red weather balloon. And it goes up pretty high. And I was using a tether um, so that it wouldn't fly away completely. And I discovered uh, the more I did it that the most interesting part of the experience to me was sharing that tether with other people um, who were also interested in flying the balloon. And so then at this point I had multiple strings that were all colored and, and it, was, uh, it became this sort of group performance activity that was somehow strangely bonding. And so afterwards, we would walk away from the experience and have shared this activity together. So I find that very intriguing. Um, there's another one here. Um, this is from the same location. This is Angel's Gate, which is an old military base um, right at the port of uh, San Pedro. 
So it's a really interesting sight. From here you can see the ocean. And we're standing on an old uh, satellite, basically um, a dish where there used to be a big radar um, dish. And now it's just an empty circle. So I, I found that very intriguing as a site that was both military and now uh, occupied by, not occupied, but used by artists professionally. So it's, a, it's an arts cultural center now. Um, and then right down here, so this one is uh, from the neighborhood I live in, which is North Park. And uh, just about every year now, they have this event called Take, There Goes the Neighborhood. And um, so this, you can, as you watch it, you mostly can see these rooftops. And uh, I really liked how the design of the parking area here, which becomes really just abstract white lines. And on top of the rooftop, you realize this is empty space. And you can sort of imagine, well, what would happen if you put a bunch of dancers on that rooftop? Or what would happen if you had a whole little group doing an activity here? And you can see this yellow string, which is like a sort of a repeated theme at the, at the very bottom of which is uh, one of our, our dear friends, Michael, who's here somewhere, and who also uh, designed all the sound for these videos. So if you get a chance, um, you can hear them best if you get up close to them, and it just changes for each one. So that's the project in a nutshell. It's an ongoing series. Um, the idea is to just do these activities uh, whenever I get the opportunity and to keep creating these little interventions. So, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so, like Ricardo said, um, I had the privilege of receiving a grant from CalIT2 this summer, the CalIT2 Summer Scholars Grant. And Ricardo was my mentor, and so we wanted to work together to implement um, different um, projects for the drones at home phase three. And originally, Ricardo suggested that I um, uh, structure everything around working with Alex for his drone project. And so I worked with him throughout the summer to kind of figure out a, a platform for the drone, what it was going to look like, and I was in dialogue with him. But I also did a lot of... Um, information collecting and gathering and contemplation around the difference between militaristic use of drone technology and aesthetic use of drone technology, which I think is the, uh, the real conversation that this show uh, is about. Um, and I, I gave a talk at a, a student gathering that we had on campus with all of the UCs about technology and the student movement and how that relates to artistic uses of technology. Um, and then towards the end of the internship, um, there were two things that happened that really kind of spurred um, the creation of this. First was a tour that we were giving and we, we talked about what was up and what was going to be happening and then somebody raised their hand and said, well, what is a drone? So that made me really realize that being in conversation with Ricardo, with Alex, with all of these people that are privileged to this access of um, information and knowing what it is, results in these uh, conversations. Um, but these conversations are in, in and of themselves a form of privilege because not everybody knows what even a drone is in and of itself. Uh, and so why uh, that technology might need questioning. Um, and then the other thing that happened, um, because this was in a, a research setting that I was doing it, was a study that came out on, uh, from Stanford that was talking about how organic food is not healthy and there's no benefits of buying organic food. And then there was a whole scandal because it turned out to be funded by Cargill and other um, biochemical corporations that were very against um, organic food. And so um, it made me really think about the, the performativity of research and the, the different influences um, that can have a bias on the objectivity of research. And so that's why I really created this. And I think part of the reason why this show is here to kind of comment on, you know, 
um, being at um, a quickly privatizing institution, you know, we are we are a public school, but it is uh, continually being uh, funded by private sources, and so this has a big effect on you know the kind of information and the discourses that come out of these universities. Um, and so I created this, and you know, um, we have the open data, uh, the open drone database. We have the the iDrone, and these are sources of information, but they're also digital sources of information that not everyone will have access to. And so this is also a comment on accessibility. And you know, um, I put, I created a blog to kind of talk about and uh, aggregate this information for people to have access to. But you know, not everyone will have access to it because not everyone has a smartphone and can scan into this um, this blog and this source of information. So it's also a comment on um, information accessibility and what that means for drone technologies and emergent technologies. So yeah, I think that's, that's about it. So, um, I think one of the uh, things that about this drone divide, I mean, it was really quite evident last night in the, in the presidential debate, right? Uh, where the question is brought up, but then uh, uh, the host said, well, everybody knows, right, what the, what the decisions are, what the choices are. Uh, yet, as you speak to the communities out here in the university, students, uh, what have you, uh, the conversation hasn't even begun. That is, there is a, a, a drone divide in, in, in terms of uh, the politics of drones, uh, the aesthetics of drones, the engineerings of drones, uh, and so even when one uses the quote-unquote uh, proper language as opposed to uh, 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 what is a, uh, what would be politically incorrect term, drones, that is unmanned uh, uh, aerial vehicles, still there's no language in conversation. So again, part of the project with Jordan and uh, Sheldon and I was to begin to try to understand to some degree at least within this privileged community, of what dronology might participate in, uh, and who does have access to this information, and how and when. Uh, and if in a presidential debate, uh, it's sort of targeted but yet disappears, uh, certainly a conversation could take place uh, for an hour among the president uh, and, and the contender to you know, try to figure this thing out. Uh, and so, in terms of this question, if it's politically correct to speak of unmanned aerial vehicles, then uh, um, um, Alex Rivera, if, if we'll move in, is basically looking at what might be undocumented uh, um, uh, unmanned vehicle, or let's see, unmanned aerial vehicles so would be undocumented uh, aerial vehicle uh, at play. So it will follow Alex inside. Uh, anyways, uh, thanks, uh, Ricardo. Thank you, everybody, for um, everybody here at Cal IT2 for having me, and thanks you all for coming out this evening. Um, so this is very much in process. This uh, object that I'm working on here is called a hex, and. Um, my starting points for thinking about it were a few. One was the invitation from, uh, from Jordan, Sheldon, and Ricardo to participate in, in this uh, symposium, Drones at Home, here at the University of California, San Diego. So that was one starting point for the thought. Then the other was the question of drones. And so you start to look at the landscape. I started to think about what would be appropriate in this space, um, San Diego, the university, dealing with drones. What's interesting to me? As Ricardo mentioned, uh, seven years ago, um, I built a small um, drone with my collaborator, Angel Nevarez, that um, reckoned with the U.S.-Mexico border and the emerging use of drones on the border. Uh, in 2005, uh, vigilantes were basically taking remote control airplanes, putting cameras on them. This was the group that was ante antecedent to the Minutemen, and they were flying these remote control airplanes over the desert in Arizona saying, look, we're flying a drone over the desert. Um, the government isn't. Why aren't they? And CNN came out, ABC, CBS, NBC, all the, uh, all the networks came out to create a bunch of hype and publicity around the, the issue that drones were not being deployed over the border. And that was a kind of performance done by the vigilantes to, um, to kind of compel the federal government to deploy drones on the border. They did. And so in 2005, Angel and I were sort of thinking about that and, and thinking about an answer. And 
our answer, uh, limited as it was, was to create um, a low rider type drone, a drone that used Latino aesthetics and that instead of being invisible as drones try to be, uh, it was very visible. Instead of being um, oriented towards surveillance and vigilance, it was oriented towards border hopping and uh, transnationality. And so we launched the, that little machine from Tijuana and it hopped here to the US and back and forth. And that was right, right here in this gallery for a few months, a few months ago. Um, so the border I felt like I'd tangled with. And so I was thinking, what are some other contested sites here in San Diego related to drones? And it turns out there's a plethora of them. Um, right about, uh, you know, maybe half a mile north of here is General Atomics, the uh, manufacturer of the Predator drone, which is the most deployed drone in, by the Air Force and the CIA right now, responsible for the, um, or the tool in w that, that is used for the majority of the, the, the killings that have occurred in the drone war. And so I started to think really about, about that, about number one, just the very, very plain and simple fact of that drones are, amongst all these other uses, the primary motivating force for their development is so-called defense, which looks a lot like offense. It, it, it's, it's, it's dealing with human bodies vis-a-vis -vis death. And so the body becomes a very, very spectacular um, phantom in the drone discourse, both because to be a drone, it needs to be unmanned, right? The other, the other way you can say drone is unmanned aerial vehicle. The very first word in its description is that there's not a person. And yet, we know that they're deployed around the world t turning people into dust. And so the bodilessness of the machine and yet this very carnal action that they're part of seems to be, to me, the kind of core of um, what's motivating the investment and the design and the um, proliferation of drones. And obviously they're having any number of ricochets and echo effects in all segments of society, but the, the, the core orientation is around a, a disembodied technology to disembody people down below. And so I started to think about <clears throat> the body and with, uh, with uh, research assistance of Sean and, and dialogue with others, a platform, a way to, um, to, to physicalize this, this idea. And so we started off with um, this, this, is a, this machine here is based on an Ardu-copter, which is, um, so the, the platform underneath here is, uh, driven by an Arduino board, which is an um, open source bit of hardware. So the design for the actual computer, you can get online and you can build one yourself. Um, you can buy them pre-built, which is what I did. Um, the software which populates the board and which makes the machine fly is also open source. And so in two key ways, as much as the Predator is about um, secrecy, this is about openness. And as, in as much as the Predator is about being bodiless. I wanted to try to think of a way of rebodying um, the drone, and uh, I was contemplating its shape, the language that these struts here are called arms, and um, I was in Mexico at the time and seeing Day of the Dead iconography start to come alive all around, and the simple idea of rebuilding the drone from bones, from human bones seemed to be like it might be a provocative way of um, kind of closing a circuit where the, this machine that calls itself unmanned and yet is, is very carnal in its effects, perhaps creating one that was re-bodied. Re and by using, uh, these are actually radial bones from human arms, uh, that my intention <clears throat> is to ultimately replace the metal arms with the, uh, with the bone arms. And uh, it'll have a camera system, I'm hoping, mounted up about here to take self-portraits of it as it flies over um, certain landscapes of drone production here in San Diego. So that's next week. Right now, it's in a kind of interstitial uh, design phase. Um, more work to be done. But the core of the gesture is here. And um, anyways. It's, uh, it's, to me, it's, it, the, the process of arriving with this idea was an organic one of like 
contemplating a landscape here around San Diego that I was invited into, and then contemplating the available technologies, and then the, the problematics of them, and what might be, what might be a reckoning or a response in, in some way. And so anyways, it's a starting point, and feel free to come closer and, and get a better look, and also I look forward to dialogue or questions. Gracias, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> So um, there's going to be another panel on November the 1st uh, with uh, uh, Gregory Shalet from iDrone and Ian Allen Pohl from uh, Do Not Kill Registry, um, who also participated in, in the Hex Drone and uh, some of the work around here. Uh, so in this game of drones uh, that is, is you know, participating in, in the space here, uh, that is, how do artists intervene into the nature uh, of this dronology? Uh, what is different from the aesthetic intervention, from the engineering intervention, from the uh, political intervention, and, and what languages are created out of that? It's certainly something that I think uh, is part of this long process of thinking this out. And uh, last night, uh, as I was reading uh, uh, Paul Virilio, uh, he was saying that we need to move away from just the museum of disasters and we need to start mobilizing the university of disasters. So uh, in a certain sense this uh, uh, arc uh, of dronology might be a way to initiate a university of disasters, right, where we can begin to investigate those different uh, elements uh, at play. Now. Um, one of the uh, issues on November 1st is we're going to attempt a flight, depending on, on the mood of the hex and uh, what hexing. So we certainly invite you on, on, uh, back on November 1st uh, to uh, meet Gregory Chalette, one of the graduates of uh, our fine program, uh, speak with uh, Ian Allen Paul, and then um, uh, Sheldon will be doing uh, um, unmanned choreographies following this exhibition, uh, which I think is, I can't remember the exact date, but you can find, what is it? The 15th of November. Uh, and then on uh, November 29th will be uh, theorist and I would say also artist, Arthur and Mary Louise Croker, uh, who will be presenting uh, a piece called, I think, Exit Humanity, and another piece on drones along the way. So again, I, I thank you and I welcome you to uh, phase three of Home uh, Drones at Home. Thank you. Thank you.